are again continuing our series on the divine attributes of God. And as you'll see on the screen above me, we are examining uh, this very passage of Scripture, this 33rd Psalm, which we've had read to us in two parts, uh, concerning the sovereignty of God. Of course, as I know some of you are aware, the sovereignty of God is quite the field of theology generally. It is a massive field of study. There is so many texts that could be proclaimed and exegeted and examined and cross-referenced and so on and so forth on our way through our understanding of the sovereignty of God. I have been a part of and have written about series of the sovereignty of God that have gone for half a year, have gone for six months. And so this area of theology is not something that will be covered in 45 approximate minutes this morning. But what we'll be doing, as is our custom here, is to examine what is the fundamental theological basis of this particular attribute, namely the sovereignty of God. Namely that God is, by his nature, sovereign, and we'll examine from this 33rd Psalm what that means, as well as how he is sovereign in his will, and the concept of the will of God being sovereign in this world. One thing which is most overtly and evidently proclaimed from Genesis all the way through to the revelation of John is that God is king. Indeed, he is given even greater references than mere monarchial ones, like the king of kings, which is actually an imperial title, which goes all the way back to ancient Persia. And so indeed, this concept of God as monarch, this God as emperor, God as king, of king over all kings, the king over all rulers, the king of queens as well, indeed, this is proclaimed so thoroughly throughout the scriptures, is it not? What we must then understand is that the attributes so intimately tied to this concept, to this reality, that God is indeed sovereign, that he is indeed king, is that he by his nature is sovereign. His role, his position, his being of king over all the world, over all the people, over all the nations, over all the plants, over all the animals, over all the planets, indeed speaks forth and proclaims so boldly his sovereignty. The fact that God in his being and in his nature is indeed sovereign. That that sovereignty is over all. When we examine these attributes, and I know I remind us every week, but it is a good reminder to have, we are not dissecting the being of God and parceling these little attributes into nice tiny little boxes. Indeed, as we looked at in the perfection of God, all these attributes are in fact indivisible. God is not a schizophrenic where he is acting out of sovereignty one time and then acting out of a different attribute another time and a different one yet again. They are all of the one God. And in fact, from his perspective, would be all of the one attribute. We examined that in weeks past. But how we understand the sovereignty of God will be impacted and determined by what we have seen in previous weeks. When we have seen that God is truthful, that he is the embodiment of truth, that he is, like we saw last week, omnipotent, that he is all-powerful, that he is the definition of wisdom in the week prior, and so on and so forth. And it's through this kind of systematic study and proclamation from the scriptures that we are to understand how it is that he is indeed sovereign over all things. And so to call him sovereign is in fact to call him the one true ruler over all. Period, full stop. No caveats, no parentheses, no addendums or asterisks. He is sovereign over all things. Anything you envision, he is sovereign over it. He rules over all things, and nothing is outside of the scope of his sovereignty. Indeed, as the early 20th century theologian, Abraham Kuyper, who was 
reformed. He was a Dutchman. He was, in fact, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands from 1901 to 1905, I believe. A prolific writer and a prolific statesman. He said this of the sovereignty of God, and it's perhaps one of the best encapsulations that I've ever read of this particular statement. Quote, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out, mine. Indeed, he says, mine. All things are mine, says Christ. And in fact, he did literally say this. You may recall from the end of the Gospel of Matthew, just before his ascension, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Not some, not parcels, not a little bit in the midst of others who have some rightful claim, no. Indeed, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And it is upon that proclamation and his final address to the disciples that he ascends to the right hand of the Father and is seated, is coronated, is crowned and fulfills so many of the great Old Testament prophecies concerning his rightful reign. And so what we'll do this morning is we will be exegeting that 33rd Psalm and the, and the encapsulated verses therein that speak to this reality of the sovereignty of God. The 33rd Psalm is one of the most prolific areas of the scriptures that speaks forth about the sovereignty of God. And so it would be good across the coming week to either re-listen to this sermon on our website, katoombabaptist.org.au, or to find us on YouTube and to listen back to this sermon or to read that psalm through. I've uh, already been told by a number of you that you uh, completed last week's proverbial uh, Homework, I suppose, of reading the 94th Psalm. And I'm glad that you indeed did that and you've told me so many things. I look forward to hearing more about it after the service. But this Psalm, the 33rd Psalm, speaks so powerfully and so poignantly to the sovereignty of God. And so we will be exegeting this text and cross referencing other relevant areas of the scriptures as well as we go through. So let us read. I'll give the opening verses which provide the kind of pretext. So from verse 1 of the 33rd Psalm. Shout for joy in Yahweh, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to Yahweh with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. This is not an uncommon opening to any of the Psalms, be they Davidic or otherwise. Because indeed, this proclamation of the glory of God, of the kingship of God, of the sovereignty of God, is rightfully met with great shouts and songs of praise and of worship, with doxology. The phrase, sing a new song, often just to give context, comes in the face of victory on the part of the Israelites, especially if they had had a recent military conquest or victory in battle. And it was a shout of victory. And a number of the Psalms are written, of course, in that context. And so that provides some of the framework. This is a proclamation of the victory, not just merely of the warriors of the kingdom of Israel, but indeed of God, who is their strength, of God, who is their might and who is their champion, who is their warrior. And so it's upon that basis that we then read from first four the following. For the word of Yahweh is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of Yahweh. By the word of Yahweh the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe before him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And so in those verses 4 through 9, there are a number of key points to understand here. We see at the top of that in verse 4, 
The word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord, is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. We're quite used to that kind of language or rhetoric throughout the Psalms and throughout the scriptures more broadly. The word of the Lord is upright. It is true. It is righteous. It is accurate. It is factual. It is so on. It is right. But do we ever actually pause to consider the reality that indeed there is only one being of whom such a saying could be said? The word of Yahweh is upright. The word of Yahweh is true. I hate to break any, any news to anyone, but every single one of us in here is a liar. Redeemed liars, liars that God is sanctifying every day by his grace, and liars who shall one day have the full curse of sin removed in our glorified state. But nonetheless, here we are. There is no one you, you know, that you know who can ever be said of that their word is, in totality, upright. That of them all their work is done in faithfulness. Right? Faithful. Being consistent to that which was said, that which was promised. Being true to that which was proclaimed as true. We saw all but a couple of weeks ago the fact that God is the very embodiment of truth, and that is, of course, what that is speaking to. But ultimately, it is speaking to the fact that he is sovereign. Why? Because it is only one who is truly sovereign over the things of the world, over the events of history, who can promise covenantally to do A, B, and C, and then actually have the authority and the power to make sure that A, B, and C are actually fulfilled, are brought to fruition. This is why it is so vital that we understand these attributes, not in isolation, but in fact in perfect harmony, together, as intimately and intricately intertwined and interrelated. He is the only one of whom such words could ever be said that indeed his word is upright and his works, which spring forth from his words, from his will, are indeed faithful because he has the sovereignty by which to actually ensure that those things come about. Of course, other such attributes are mentioned in verse 5. He loves righteousness and justice and the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love is, of course, a designation or is an attribute that is very often and very frequently ascribed to God, not just in the Psalms, but across the Old Testament and the Scriptures at large. In fact, it's one of the most common. And that concept, in tying in with verse 4, of being able to be steadfast, of being constant and having and possessing constancy across time, down throughout the ages hinges upon the reality that God is sovereign over the affairs of men and over the affairs of the world at large. And so in verse 6 we read, By the word of Yahweh the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. Harkening back to the opening chapters of Genesis, of course. By the word of his mouth, which we examined in part last week is such an incredible description of his power. We do not find in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 this epic exposition that you find in the various mythologies and cosmologies of the pagans, of the gods fighting great battles and wars against the other races or generations of gods, where they exert much effort, where they struggle, where they fight and go forth to bring about that which they seek to create. No, indeed, he merely speaks and so it is, without lifting a proverbial finger. He does this by his mere words. He forms atoms out of nothing. 
He forms planets and stars, thousands and millions of times the mass of our own planet by merely speaking and saying, be. Be, and so it is. Exist, and so it exists. The sovereignty over the very formation of matter is something which is ascribed to God. He speaks, and indeed the heavens were made, and they were made by the breath of his mouth, all these host. He gathers, in verse 7, the waters of the sea as a heap, and he puts the deep in storehouses. Not, a, nearly, not merely a reference just to the sea as it exists, but in its poetic fashion, as is customary of the Psalms, is a reference to these waters of chaos. The seas and the waters in ancient times, and in fact throughout most of history, have symbolically referred and metaphorically referred and been associated with chaos. Many of the great monsters in pagan religions, for example, were sea serpents for that reason. The waters being associated with chaos. And of course, this is in fact, even at a baseline level, true. Amidst the great evil of the antediluvian world in the days of Noah, what indeed did God destroy the world with? Water. That was not merely by coincidence or accident. It is because, in fact, the waters have represented to those very people chaos. And they reaped what they sowed. They sowed wickedness and chaos, and so therefore wickedness and chaos brought about their destruction. But it says here in verse 7 that he gathers the waters of the sea as a heap and he puts the deep in storehouses. He controls those waters. He is sovereign and he is powerful above and beyond chaos itself. We examined that, if you may recall, in the very first sermon in our series, Christ or Chaos, when we examined some of those opening verses from Genesis chapter 1 about the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep. It's this same reference. And of God ordering this primordial chaos. He is sovereign even over the darkest and most chaotic of things that we see and we perceive. Things which frighten and terrify us as people. He transcends that. He is beyond that. He is above that. And he is sovereign over it. And so in verse 8 we are told by the psalmist, let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Many of the great men of renown throughout the history of the world have indeed tried to make the multitude stand in awe of them through grandiose displays of pomp and of ceremony, of great statues, of incredible temples, of magnificent palaces, leading to great adoration and awe and praise and often worship, thinking so mightily of their own position as king of whatever on earth they happen to have been king of. But indeed we are told here that the earth should fear but one. It should fear Yahweh. It should fear this power that, as we saw last week, is all-powerful. That is powerful over all things, that is powerful eternally, that is powerful infinitely, and that is powerful beyond any comparison whatsoever. One should fear the power of the Lord. And the psalmist proclaims that all the inhabitants of the earth of the world should stand in awe of him. Because as we said at the top, he is the only one who can truly be called sovereign. He is the only one who can truly be called such, matter, such things as sovereign. And so awe 
on the back of fear is the rightful response in the face of this sovereignty. The world that we live in is hierarchical. God has instituted various authorities and orders in the world, as is his sovereign right. And so we hold healthy levels of respect for various levels of authority. The child should indeed respect their parents. They should fear their parents, particularly the head of their household, their father. There should be a healthy level of respect for the judge in a courtroom as the one who presides over the hand of justice represented in the court. And this can be applied to, a various, to various amounts of circumstances in our society. Indeed, then, what should our reaction be to the one who is sovereign far and above all of them? The, whose sovereignty is incomparable compared to the mere sovereignty that is given to people by this sovereign God. For anyone in positions of leadership or of power in any capacity, they should often remind themselves that indeed they are always a man under duty, a man under orders, one who has sovereignty or authority in whatever particular capacity only by virtue of the fact that they have been given that by the one who is true and who is ultimately sovereign over all things. We see in verse 9, concluding this section, He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. There is hardly a more straightforward and plain exposition of the sovereignty of God than verse 9. And of his omnipotence, and of his truthfulness, and of the various other attributes we've examined. He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. When you actually read through Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice that that chapter alone is a pattern of cycles, seven specifically. But you will notice a common theme that every single day is written in the exact same fashion. And God said, and so it was. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. And God said, and so it was. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the second day. Over and over. And God said, and so it was. This is a direct hearkening back to these famous words from Genesis chapter 1 that demonstrate his sovereignty, his omnipotence, his truthfulness, his faithfulness, the fact that he is able to speak and so it is. And so these verses, particularly 4, 6 and 9, which are all held in parallel together, proclaim forth that God is in his nature and by his being sovereign over all things. And so we then can understand upon that platform that indeed the will of God, his purposes in the world, are therefore rightly to be understood as sovereign. We see this from verses 10 through 17. Wherein we read that Yahweh, verse 10, brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of Yahweh stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Yahweh looks down from heaven, he sees all the children of man. From where he sits, enthroned, he looks out upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all of their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. Indeed, the war horse is a false hope for salvation. 
and by its great might it cannot rescue. What here we are being given is an undeniable proclamation that the will of God is sovereign, for he himself is sovereign. Everything that flows forth from him is sovereign. All his attributes are sovereign. In verse 10 we see that Yahweh brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. This inherently tells us in no uncertain terms that the plans, that the machinations, the ideas, the actions, the purposes, the will of people is under his sovereignty, is under his sovereign authority. He is sovereign over the will and over the hearts of men. That is why he is able to bring their counsel, right, their planning, their purposes, to nothing. Be they good, be they bad, no matter what they are, he is able to frustrate the plans of the people, those who would conspire against him, to use the language of Psalm 2. Those who would, in their hubris and their pride and their arrogance, stand abreast and say, let us cast off the bonds that have been placed upon us. Let us break the chains of those who have put upon us. What does that second psalm tell us in response? He who sits in heaven laughs. He laughs at the plans and the machinations of the wicked, which is that particular reference there in Psalm 2, and who is envisioned here in verse 10. The scheming, the lying, the covert and clandestine planning and purposing to achieve their sinful and wicked ends, the desires of their fallen and corrupt hearts. Indeed, the one who sits enthroned in heaven, this Christ who is our king, and who is the king over all kings, he laughs at such plans. He laughs at the hubris with which they envision the might of their sovereignty and of their power. And in contrast to verse 10, paralleled with that, we see in verse 11, the counsel of Yahweh stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Do you see the contrast between verses 10 and 11? Right, the counsel of the nations is brought to nothing by Yahweh. Right, he frustrates the plans of the peoples. Instead, verse 11, the counsel of Yahweh stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. In contrast to the plans of people, particularly the wicked who are envisioned here in this verse, their plans are temporary, they are fleeting, they are ultimately nothing, and they are rendered meaningless, purposeless, and they are rendered asunder by the one whose counsel, whose plans, whose will stands forever and is sovereign over all. This is why the psalmist is then able to say in verse 12 and proclaim, blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen in his, as his heritage. Why? Because if they are indeed his people and they are chosen according as his heritage, which we are told there, then God's will will be their will. The plans of God will be their plans. They will not seek and should not seek plans and purposes that are beyond or are outside of or are contrary and contradicting the plans and the will of their God. And they are blessed because they can have hope and true, steadfast, abiding assurance that indeed the one who works all things together for the good of those who love him, that he will in fact accomplish those things because he is sovereign. That is why we are blessed. Because we are blessed not in our own might or our own right or by our own will or sovereignty, but because our will is 
has been and will continue to be conformed into the image of Christ as we are sanctified by the power of his spirit, as we have been saved, are being saved and will be saved, to use the New Testament language. And again, even the element of his sovereignty over these matters is expounded in the second half of that verse 12. Right? This people whom he has chosen as his inheritance, as his heritage, that he has chosen. Again, we are not ones who in our great magnanimity have come to God and said, yes, I'll be a part of your team. Yes, yes, I'll join your kingdom. Thank you very much, sir. No, indeed, we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Dead, gone, hopeless, corrupt, beyond any self-fixing of any kind whatsoever, beyond any ability to repair ourselves, to make ourselves righteous, to make ourselves morally good, as has been the constant toil of the pagans for thousands of years. Clamoring and clawing their way through endless, meaningless ritual to appease gods and deities and demons who have no ability to save, to help, to provide hope in any way, shape or form. But indeed, God has chosen us in his sovereignty and for his sovereign purposes, and we'll cover that in more detail shortly. And so in verse 13, we continue reading. Yahweh looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of of man Again, this touches upon the transcendence of God and the omniscience of God, the fact that God knows all things. And he looks down, we're told in verse 14, from where he sits enthroned. And he looks out upon the inhabitants of the earth, again speaking to his kingship, to his imperial reign. And he observes all the deeds of those whose heart he has fashioned. In verse 15. He sees and he knows, speaking to his transcendence and his omniscience, all the deeds, all the works, all the thoughts, all the words, every secret thing of those whose heart he has fashioned, whose heart he has formed, speaking not only to his sovereignty over our creation, but indeed his sovereignty over our heart, this kind of symbolic reference to the spirit, to the will to our purposes, to that which we do. He observes it, and indeed he looks down upon it and sees our heart. And indeed he sees the heart of all. And he says this in verse 16 and 17, particularly in reference to this concept of power and sovereignty. In verse 16, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. In fact, in verse 17, the war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. This concept that the great might exhibited perhaps in no greater fashion than military might and the power and the force that one is able to bear down upon others through great military might and prowess. Indeed, such things, no matter how renowned the king, no matter how talented the warrior, no matter how great the war horse, indeed, these things are futile when it comes to saving. They're a false hope for salvation. Not just in the temporal sense, but even in the spiritual one. All the greatness and the might the various empires of the ancient world could bear down upon God's own people. That of Egypt, and that of Assyria, that of Babylon, that of Persia, and of Greece, and of Rome, 
all that might is nothing in the face of the one who is referred to as Yahweh Tsevaot, often translated as the Lord of Hosts, or literally the Lord of the Armies, or the God of War. This one who is the commander of the armies of heaven and of the army of his kingdom which we have seen displayed throughout the scriptures, have we not? You may recall the Assyrian army standing against the people of God, 185,000 warriors in total. The Assyrians were ruthless. Their time atop the world stage was brief by historical standards, but it was prolific in its fiery yet short time. And God sends out an angel. And by the morning, the encampment of the Assyrian army are dead. Gone. No more. 185,000 warriors, war horses, archers, wiped out. The might of the most majestic empire of the ancient world, that of Egypt, who ruled the world in its hegemonic power in ancient times in the days of Moses was nothing when it came to God's sovereignty over the Red Sea. And indeed in hubris, in arrogance and in pride, in spiritual blindness, in their wickedness, the Egyptians chased the Israelites across the sea across the waters that had been separated and God brought it down upon their heads. The mightiest army in the world at that time wiped out by water. Again, no surprise, water in the ancient world representing, in the seas representing chaos. They reaped what they sowed. So these things are nothing in the face of the one who is sovereign over the hearts of men who is sovereign and whose power is greater than any might that could ever be born and brought down by the nations and by the kingdoms of the world. How important perhaps is that message in our own day? Even a middle power like the Commonwealth of Australia with the grandiose sum total of its roughly 80,000 troops and its couple of hundred aircraft and its couple of dozens of ships would wipe the floor with Egypt, would wipe the floor with the Assyrians. We would conquer Babylon in about as quickly as we conquered modern Babylon inside of about three weeks in the Iraq war. We would conquer the Persians in a month. We would bring Rome to its knees in less than a year. And indeed, there are powers greater than ours, far greater, powers that are beyond even comparison. The world has never seen the kind of military might that is able to be displayed by the United States of America, even by lesser powers like the Chinese or the Russians or the United Kingdom the French and so on, the Germans, the Japanese. Do we in our hubris think that such great military might will make us righteous before a holy God? Do we think that all of the blessings materially that we have accumulated for ourselves over the last 250 years or so across the West, do we think that such things should automatically out of hand be taken as blessings from God that we must be on the right side of this because indeed why else would we be so wealthy? Why else would we be so powerful? We won the Second World War. We surely must be in good standing with God. These are all the follies and the fallacies which tempt the world in which we live. 
that tempt our society and our civilization to think that because we have progressed so far, that we have accumulated such grandiose material blessing to ourselves, that we must be in the good blessings and the favor of God. I have a sneaking suspicion that history will prove otherwise. Because indeed these various things, these great might that we see described here in these verses is indeed a false hope for salvation because they are nothing compared to the sovereign might of God in heaven. They are nothing and they are brought to nothing just as the counsel of the people is brought to nothing. And so we come to the final section of this particular psalm in verses 18 through 22 in which we find that God, in light of the fact that the might and the power and the wealth of the world and of the nations and of the kings and of the armies of earth are no true hope, we find then that God, in his sovereignty, can, by definition, be the only one in which our hope must be found. So in verse 18 through 22, Behold, the eye of Yahweh is upon those who fear him, upon those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for Yahweh. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Yahweh, be upon us, even as we hope in you. You'll notice in verse 18 that we're essentially being told a very similar thing to what we saw from verses 13 through 17. In that particular subsection, the eye of Yahweh is upon the nations and the children of men and those who would stand with their great armies against Yahweh. Yet his eye is also upon those who fear him in verse 18. Again, this parallelism and this contrasting. Behold, the eye of Yahweh is upon those who fear him. It's upon those who hope in his steadfast love, who are wise according to the scriptures. Because indeed, we saw this all but a couple of weeks ago, what is the beginning of wisdom and of understanding? According to the Proverbs, yes, the fear of the Lord. And that is why the psalmist is able to say that the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him. Why? Because they are, they are wise and have been made wise by God in order that they would put their hope in his steadfast love, not in their king, not in their warriors, not in their war horses and their great military might and all the various other things which we had just mentioned. That they would not look to the temporal and to the material for ultimate hope and salvation. And his eye is also upon us in verse 19, in order that he may deliver our soul, to, to change the um, adverb and pronoun there, that he may deliver our soul from death and keep us alive in famine. That he may deliver our souls from death, that he may save us, that he may bring salvation. Right? And keeping alive during famine is again along that kind of psalmic language, right? that metaphoric language that is so intimately tied to the concept of salvation. Famine, of course, representing death. Right? It's Hebrew parallelism of what was just said by the psalmist. Delivering the soul from death, keeping alive from famine. Right? Keeping away from the waters of chaos, to kind of coin some of the language from earlier in this psalm. Right? All these various figures of speech that are used in the context of the psalms to describe these various truths and realities. He delivers our soul from death. What does that presuppose? 
what must be the prerequisite for that statement to in fact be true. God must in fact be sovereign over death. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He is described as the author of life. The hearts of men, the hearts of the king, are in the hands of the Lord. God is the judge of the heart. There's so many pieces of scripture and so many variances of language that describe this reality. He is Lord over death. Death is not a mere specter that God has been fighting and struggling against, as is again the case of the pagan gods down throughout the ages. Where many of them, even in their own right, were at times subject to death itself. You have, across various pagan religions, gods dying. In Norse mythology, the gods of the Vikings during the Middle Ages, their great apocalypse, this event called Ragnarok, was the fate or the twilight of the gods where the gods of Odin and Thor and Freya would go to battle against these monsters of chaos. And in killing these, god, these monsters of chaos, they themselves would die. Meaning what? That the gods of the people have been subjected to death, something that is somehow beyond their control. Apart from mere violations of the first and the second commandments, it's almost pointless when you actually look back as to how pathetic the gods, the idols, that humans have manufactured in their hearts have actually turned out to be. You would not worship nor follow them merely out of their pragmatic competence or lack thereof. Worshipping a God who can die and who dies, and not in the fashion that Christ our Lord died, his divinity did not somehow end, just as our spirit does not end in death. But in these pagan examples, no, the gods die. They're no more. They're gone. Our God is eternal. Our God is infinite. Our God is everlasting. And he is the Lord of death. That is why he was able to send, as the tenth plague upon Egypt, what? An angel of death. That was not some demonic spirit in control of by Satan that was an angel of God the angel of death under God's orders he is the master of death and lest that scare us lest that put us off we should indeed in fact take hope which is the very point why? because if indeed he is sovereign over death itself it means that he is in fact able to raise us back to life. He demonstrated this sovereignty over death no more directly, no more grandly, and no more powerfully than when he raised himself from the dead. For indeed Christ died and on the third day arose in glory. Demonstrating, proclaiming, that he is sovereign over death itself, that he has conquered death and will continue to conquer death until death is no more, till he has destroyed death once and for all. And so we can know and we can rightfully place our hope in him who is able to deliver, to save, to rescue our soul from death. And so the psalmist concludes in verse 20, our soul waits for Yahweh. He is our help and our shield. Why? Because only he is truly sovereign over all of these things. And for indeed our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. <clears throat> 
We trust in his sovereignty. And by his grace, we have been redeemed so that we may be able to trust in his sovereignty. And therefore, in his final doxology, in his words to Yahweh, the psalmist says in verse 22, Let your steadfast love, O Yahweh, be upon us, even as we hope in you. And so indeed, this psalm in particularly that doxology there in verse 22, must be the heart cry of all those who place their trust in this help and in this shield that is Yahweh, that is the Lord, that is God. That no matter what goes on in our own lives personally, the various trials and struggles and pain and suffering, what goes on in the lives of our loved ones around us, of our families and of our friends, of our church family. The struggles that we share with each other, that we fellowship in, that we stand alongside. And then even more broadly, the trials and the tribulations, the calamities, the pain, the suffering, the difficulties, the chaos, the turmoil, the death and the destruction that in various cycles occurs in our societies and in the time in history in which we live. When things seem overwhelming, when we are constantly being drip-fed nothing but hopelessness and of misery from so-called news stations and media corporations, whose job is to addict, get you addicted to the proverbial pornography of fear. Turn off the news. Stop listening to the false prophets that parade themselves on television and proclaim to you to have wisdom which they most certainly do not. Place not your trust in princes who come to you every election cycle promising to deliver to you whatever particular desire you may have, who promise you the world and deliver you crumbs. Get out of that mentality. And instead, place your trust, your hope, your confidence, your faith in the only one who is truly sovereign over all of these aforementioned things. And not out of blind faith, but in fact because what we can read and see in his word that testifies to us that he has indeed been faithful, that the promises that he made all the way back to David and to Moses and to Abraham, to Noah, all the way back to Adam and Eve, that he has fulfilled those promises and continues to fulfill those promises, that his word is steadfast. Christians have faced calamity and chaos before and will again. But what has allowed God's people to endure from a temporal pragmatic perspective is their abiding trust and confidence, not in their own ability or capabilities, but in the sovereignty of their God, who is King of Kings, who is Lord of Lords, who is the divine emperor over all the world. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.